WBNE. Howdy, Yolks. Before we get started today, we just wanted to let you know that this episode of Bacon and Eggs is brought to you by our patrons. Patrons? I know patrons. Like patrons of the arts. Exactly. Patrons of the arts. We want to build this thing to be as big as it can be, and we want to make more podcasts for you. But what is a podcast? Um, I, that's, a, that's a word that escapes me. So a podcast, um, Mr. Mr. Greek uh, historical figure. Who sounds a lot like Coach Tucker. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a podcast is basically people just sitting around and, and talking the way that the great masters might. Um, ah, but yes. instead of just talking to people, they talk into these little devices that then allow their voices to project across the whole world. Amazing. I love it. What will the gods think of next? <laughs> uh, but we can't do it alone. If you enjoy this ep episode and want more bacon and eggs, head over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash bacon and eggs and check out our new $10 tier, which grants you access not only to our bonus show, The Hash Browns, but you'll also get access to unedited episodes of bacon and eggs. That now, can you explain to me how how a breakfast feast is fits into movie reviews? I cannot. All right, fantastic. Uh, you get to hear all the behind-the-scenes moments that go into making an episode, and we could really use your help to make this podcast the best it possibly the best it possibly can be. So thank you for donating, and thank you even more for listening. Thank you, and let's go from zero to hero. I don't know what I'm doing. Howdy, Yolks, and welcome back to Bacon and Eggs. I'm Jordan Bulky. And I'm Scott Nicewander. And today we're putting the Glad and Gladiator. Or maybe we're just down to one last hope. So go the distance. And three words, listen up. Because today we're bringing you... Disney's Hercules. Everyone. So some fun facts, quick facts about uh, Disney's Hercules. It was directed by Ron Clemens and John Musker. Uh, it was released on June 27th, 1997, which is 8,609 days ago. Scott, how old were you in 1997? I was going to ask you the same question. Uh, I was a bouncing, beautiful four-year-old. I would have been seven. I was born in 1990. I I was I was 92, but my birthday would not have been just yet. It would have been a couple months after this. So that's almost five. Mm -hmm. uh, the budget for Hercules was 85 million dollars, and they made 252.7 million dollars worldwide. Um, and as far as Renaissance era movies go, um, Hercules really underperformed for Disney. I've heard this. I've heard that it was like people say it's kind of like the turning point for like, and eh, maybe we're out of the Renaissance now. Mm -hmm. More than a little bit. And it looks like that from the uh, critic scores as well. So on Rotten Tomatoes, we had an 84% critic score and a 76% audience score. And on Metacritic, uh, it was just a 74 on Metacritic. <sighs> You know what? That's it feels low to me. And I thought I rated it low, but that feels low mm -hmm. overall. On that note, Scott, what is your binary review? Uh, do do you recommend that people see this? A hundred percent. Absolutely. Of course I do. Same here. Same here. It, it, I even if you don't think it's a particularly good movie, I still think that it's a very, very fun watch. Absolutely. I think it's got very funny moments there. I haven't seen it since I was a kid and I remember loving it. So watching it, rewatching it again last night, it I caught a lot of jokes that I would not have gotten as a kid. And I think that's pretty good. I was thinking the exact same thing. There were some jokes that like maybe I would have understood as a kid or, or I still would have found it funny, but I didn't understand the extra level of the joke sometimes. Yeah, the the one that kind of got to me, I think, was Thebes being framed as very New York, New York City. Uh, like they're calling it the Big Olive instead of the Big Apple. Mm -hmm. uh, Phil's doing that whole like I'm walking here kind oh, of. That bit. was a great line. So. The the hey kid, you wanna buy a sundial? Just <laughs> yeah, so good, so funny. <laughs> you you can just you can just see the oh my gosh is this person going to be a flasher no he's trying to sell me knockoff Rolexes yeah exactly. <laughs> 
Oh, uh, incredibly wild. I yeah, I I love this movie a lot. Uh, I th- I definitely think going back to rewatch it made me realize, oh, you know, maybe there are some things uh some things wrong with it. But uh, I don't know when we want to. Do we just want to jump into it, or do we, there's there more to do at the top of the episode? Uh, yeah. Walk so let's this. let's check out these reviews real quick. I will do the positive review. Um, you pulled these reviews. Uh, I, from whom is this review? Do you know? The the positive review is from Roger Ebert. Um, the negative review I can find again. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Well, the positive review says uh, the look of their animation has a new freshness because of the style of Scarf, famous in England for his sharp penned caricatures of politicians and celebrities. The characters here are edgier and less rounded than your usual Disney heroes. The color palette, too, makes less use of basic colors and stirs in more luminous shades, giving the picture a subtly different look that suggests it is different in geography and history from most of the Disney pictures. Um, And I actually would be excited to talk about uh, Scarf at some point in the the episode because I know, like I can visualize in my head specific shots Mm -hmm. that they're talking about with that style. And they're some of my favorite shots in the whole movie. Absolutely. Yeah. So I pulled both of these reviews because they're contrasting opinions about the art style, which I know is a thing that is fairly polarizing. Uh, The negative review comes from Gene Siskel or Siskel. um, And it reads... uh, the l- the least of the new Disney animated features, a lamely drawn story about how the son of Zeus must learn to achieve greatness on his own in the earthly world of human beings. Sort of a male version of The Little Mermaid, this tale comes up way short by comparison. Zeus and his hev- uh, heavenly lair are no match for that of King Triton under the sea. Indeed, the only memorable character in the film is the nicely drawn villain Hades, who seeks to turn Hercules to the dark side also gene who wrote this review that's not what happens that that's not what hades is doing whatever watch the movie um what what do you say uh he's funny talking about hades still but the rest of the story is generic rites of passage material and the biggest surprise is how soft and cheap the animation looks this hercules in big air quotes uh doesn't even look like a disney film Ugh. Wow, rude. Uh, yeah. And a, a quick couple of listener reviews from the Discord. So Steak and Figgy Pudding says, uh, 98 out of 100. Great cast, great soundtrack. The story is fantastic and full of hilarious moments. And for a more critical review, we turn to T. Dutton, who says 60 out of 100. Probably one of my least favorite Disney movies. All around a decent film. I have just never liked it. Uh, and the average listener score was 85.5. So we'll talk about mm. how that sorts in when we do ratings at the end. Fantastic. So yeah, since both of these reviews talk about art style, do you want to talk for a minute about the art of Hercules? I would love to. Um, Absolutely. I think the color palette is great. There's a lot of like soft, like uh, there's a lot of like use of purple, which feels very regal when talking about like gods. Mm -hmm. Um, Everything is very, everything has a soft kind of color palette uh, until of course you go down to like Hades and everything is like quite harsh and like green and sickly and very contrasty. Uh, Very fun. Um, And I just love, I mean, Emily and I were pointing this out. This is the thing that I remember most about the art style as a kid. There's like so many uses of swirly lines. Um, I love the swirly lines. Like everyone's joints, like elbow joints and things are like all swirly lines. People have swirly hair. And it's uh, all over the background too. Absolutely. The clouds are so swirly. Mm -hmm. It's so, so interesting and so unique. I think this movie does not look like, I will agree with Gene in saying it doesn't even look like a Disney film, but I think that that is not a negative thing thing for me so i think in a way the art style a little bit harkens back out of the renaissance period and back into um like more original disney like with snow white where you can tell that the backgrounds uh not only are stagnant and stationary but are done in a different style so i believe for snow white it was it was watercolor and for here it Mm. looked much more like pencil drawing but it Mm -hmm. definitely set up a contrast that i think in the vast majority of times um, added to it rather than detracted from it. I would say that one scene where I thought the art style detracted is specifically after Hercules um, busts the pots uh, right at the beginning of the film with yeah. with uh, his dad Amphictryon. Um, 
and everyone got done yelling at him and they're all storming away. They're like stomping away. And just the way that that looks, which definitely wasn't something I noticed as a kid, but the background is so subdued and all of these people are stamping away in the exact same <laughs> movement in different directions. And uh-huh. it just looks really silly. Um, sure. Yeah. And I, I, perhaps that scene would have been slightly better if we were just looking at Hercules face in that moment. Sure. Yeah. It does feel like there are moments where the animation is like, "Hmm." like you can almost tell that like this was a new style for the, for the artist, And they were just like, Hmm, I don't know if that, if they quite nailed it. The one that stands out to my head is so small, but it's when Hercules learns that, he like needs to go visit Mount Olympus and his parents are like, he's like, you know, you guys are the best parents, but I gotta, I gotta know. I gotta find out. And Hercules looks out towards Mount Olympus and like the angle of Hercules's face is like this almost behind his head, but not quite. So you can still see part of his face. And it just like, I I, I can't quite describe it. It just looks like very off. Uh, not how it's supposed to. Yep. But I, I th- that being said, most of the film I think is quite good. Mm-hmm. But th- my least favorite moment of the film, both for the art style and uh, specifically how the voice actor Tate Donovan said it, is um after uh, spoilers uh, after Meg dies <laughs> and Hercules decides that he's gonna go try to change it, and he goes, mm-hmm. "Yes, I can." But like his yeah. face looks so like maybe it was a stylistic choice to make him look dark and angry, but I think it just made him not look like Hercules at all. And the yeah. way that the voice actor delivered that line just sounded like he was speaking with some weird accent that just, "Yes, I can." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we need you to be really in this moment. Can you do that? Yes, I can. Oh, actually, that was perfect. Yeah, let's just use that take. Um, like if he's in the middle of like eating a bagel or something. Um, no, but I, I, I want to talk about that. I want to get back to the art style, but just really quickly, that moment where Meg is like dying and then Hercules, it's so serious. It's so sad. It's like very heartfelt. Uh, she's not yet dead, but she's dying. And Hercules is like, I got to go. And he goes to like rescue all the other Olympians, all the other gods. And that whole scene is played very comedically. Like the action is like very comedic. Everyone's making jokes. Hades is getting like beat up upon by the Titans and everything. And so it just feels, it's so comedic. And then you're just like, Hercules is like, oh wait, that's right. Meg is dying. And he goes immediately back. Mm -hmm. So it almost just feels like this weird detour that they had to close up this loophole of like the attack on Mount Olympus and then go back and rectify this thing with Meg. And then Meg finally dies and there's a whole other thing, but it just felt like this weird tonal shift of like, Oh, it's so sad. Anyway, here's a lot of jokes. Oh, it's so sad though. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the things too about Meg's death scene is I think probably the first time watching it as a little kid, like you expect something to happen such that she won't die. Like, yeah. like you a little bit expect that he's going to get back and then suddenly they won't be able to kill her anymore. And then yeah. they don't. And so then they have you set up for that expectation so that when it later then happens to Hercules of like, yes. well, we saw before that like you can't really stop this. So is Hercules just going to die right here? You're right. Yeah. I'm sure for seven year old me, that was like traumatizing. Uh, the the whole him swimming through the like that the pool of souls is still something that's like Ugh, like it gives me little shivers because it is done so nicely and and two when Hades gets thrown into it uh, I guess that would be the river Styx probably I I that's what my thought was but it looks like it's just kind of a pool not really yeah. a river but um, oh well. But it, it, it looks slimy. It does. In, it's sort of in a similar way that uh, cutting off the Hydra's head for the first time looked mm-hmm. slimy and gross. Like it was very, very visceral. I felt like, like I could yes. touch. There was a lot of that. Because even at the beginning, Hades takes the, the eye of, of the fates and like wipes it off and like plucks a hair off. And it's oh. like this eye slime coming off of it. Oh, Hercules, a surprising amount of slime. A surprising amount of slime, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, oh, boy. So when I was younger, this this movie was absolutely one of my favorites. And I realized as I was watching it again, I can still quote slash recite the entire thing end to end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is it's- like a lot. 
It's quite good. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of lines, a lot of comedy that are still very very funny. Uh, the whole bit with Phil where he says like you know two words am scray and like the whole like two words three words whatever that whole bit is like so it just feels like something that someone th- thought of. Uh, just offhand and they like tr- put it throughout the whole movie and it's like such it's like a weird comedy thing where like I would not think to do that because it doesn't feel like it would be that funny do but you it's not funny. know the the thing behind this one no I don't know the thing behind oh, this one um, fill me in so every single time Phil says you know x number of words and the thing that he says doesn't have that many words yeah. it's because in the original greek it would have been that many words so the phrase i oh. am retired he says two yeah. words i am retired and if yeah. you were saying it in greek it would only be a two word phrase that's pretty good yeah that's really funny so, see i have a new appreciation for it so i had this movie on vhs as a child and i remember one time watching all the way through the end credits or no it even said right at the beginning of the movie like stay tuned after the movie ends for behind the scenes features or something like that and yeah. every time i watched this movie i would watch the entire behind the scenes stuff. So they would talk about like behind the scenes with the art and with the music. And there was an interview with like, you know, the producers, the directors, Alan Menken, the the composer, yeah. a lot of the voice actors, um, realization that the woman who voice acts Meg was probably the first woman I ever had a crush on as a child and just uh, didn't I- interpret yeah. or intuit that. A hundred percent. But, and then they talked about like uh, the CGI that went into the Hydra scene. And yes. some of the behind the scenes and then the behind the scenes closed with Ricky Martin singing Go the Distance in Spanish. Incredible. I, I will make sure to post that link in the uh, in the Facebook group and the Discord and stuff. So if you're not already in there, go. But there there are YouTube videos that exist of these. And yes, just seven to like 11 year old me watched these behind the scenes things Amazing. constantly. And I think is very much what uh, helped develop my love for like deep diving into movies was yes. this behind the scenes stuff. <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. I love because you had even texted me a little behind the scenes thing earlier today mm-hmm. to, to watch. And I watched that. That was very fun. Um, yeah, I have so much to say about everything you talked about. I want to talk about the, the CGI Hydra for a second, because that to me, when Emily and I were watching it last night, that d- felt like it aged quite good it didn't look bad it didn't look out of place it looked like it fit with the movie it didn't look like the you know like they weren't trying to make it realistic they were just like cgi but cartoon and mm-hmm. i think it looks great yeah i absolutely that scene so well done and it's and very good. you're right even for a you know 23 24 year old film the cgi held up it's not bad it's not i mean it helps that they're trying to go for like a stylized cartoon look uh for sure and i think they nailed it i think it's pretty good it looks menacing that fight is always very tense I think, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's just, it's quite good. Uh, I I had some other stuff that I wanted to talk about. Uh, My, my main thing is that this movie is basically just uh, Superman, right? Like (laughs) it's, it's like a kid from another world gets, uh, you know, dropped down to earth and they're like this couple that who can't have kids and they feel blessed that they've got this now kid who fell out of the sky Mm -hmm. and the kid has all these extraordinary powers and uh even like when hercules goes to talk to zeus uh on like mount olympus uh there's just like it's like superman's fortress of solitude talking to his dad and the big like ice crystal thing Mm -hmm. um even like Meg calling him Wonder Boy is like so <laughs> close to Superman. It's like right there. <sighs> and I think that's part of the reason why I liked this movie as a kid. Because I think I can look back on almost everything that I enjoyed as a kid. And it's all tied back to like superheroes or people with superpowers or things that feel like superhero things, but even if they're not necessarily superhero things. And I think Hercules fits into that where it's I like mean, he flies. He flies. He's got a flying horse. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I mean, he's just 
it feels very, I mean, even like he loses his powers, crypt, you know, Superman's got mm-hmm. his kryptonite thing that weakens him and he still tries to fight. Even like the- Meg is his weakness. Meg is his weakness. It's his kryptonite. Everybody's got a weakness. Mm-hmm. I just need you to find his. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that was my main thought going through this. It's like, yeah, this movie is just Superman, uh, but that's good. I like it a lot. Uh, oh, speaking on like the whole like- um, the Phil doing the whole like two words thing. Another joke that I did not get as a kid during the Hydra battle was when pain and panic disguised as kids said, someone call I X I I. Yes. <laughs> Which is quite funny. <laughs> so good. So funny. Yeah. There, there were a few jokes that I just did not. It, it's not that I didn't get them as a kid. It's that I didn't really understand the depth of why they're funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree even with something that. like, you know, I haven't seen this much love in a room since Narcissus discovered himself. Yeah, like, that's pretty good. <laughs> even really knowing uh like Greek history and mythology and knowing the story of Narcissus and how he falls in love with his own reflection, like mm-hmm. like haha, it's funny, but just as an adult it's like, you know, that's that's a little bit funnier than I remember. Yeah, I, like cuz even they they do like visually pan over to like Hopefully you can get in on the joke if you don't understand that reference. They're like, oh, here's a person who's looking at themselves in a mirror and making kissy faces. Like, oh, okay, they're they're just incredibly narcissistic, mm-hmm. uh, you might say. Um, but I think, and I could be remembering this wrong, but I think Hermes at the very beginning of the movie comes up with like a a bouquet of flowers and says, yeah, I had Orpheus do the arrangement. Isn't that nutty? And that was quite funny as well as a thing that I would not have gotten as a Mm -hmm. kid. Yeah. So, and, uh, yeah, the, there's the bit at right at the beginning too, where Zeus makes fun of, uh, Hades and is like, you'll work yourself to death. But I, I didn't get as a child, the don't be such a stiff because a stiff is another, word for a dead body that probably young me didn't get and old me is like oh yeah yeah i get that yeah it does feel okay i i want to talk about hades for a second because there is this big plot point at the end of the film where he makes a deal with hercules to like give up his powers and meg won't get hurt for like a day or whatever. And then that whole contract is over when Meg does get hurt. And then Hercules goes and makes another deal with Hades about, you know, rescuing Meg. Um, And it just felt like that whole aspect of his character was not set up well. Like this idea that Hades makes deals with people. Cause the first time I think they talk about it is when he's trying to explain kind of to the audience why Meg is even his lackey. And it's cause Mm -hmm. she made a deal with him to rescue Or to, like, save her boyfriend, but her boyfriend went away. So it's just, like... And that's, like, halfway through the movie. So, like, there's a part of me that's, like, I wish they had just... That was part of his character introduction. Like, maybe he gets back to the underworld and pain and panic. Like, we've got this whole line of people ready to make deals with you. And, like, super quick over, like, ten seconds, he just makes really backhanded deals with people that always have a downside or something. And then he goes to talk to, like, the fates or whatever. But it just feels like I... We get this big thing where like the story hinges on these deals that Hercules is making with Hades. And we don't really get that set up very much. I felt in the beginning and I wish they kind of went back and, you know, gave it another look. You know that I, I don't know that I would have come up with that independently, but I don't disagree. Yeah. I wonder if, yeah, I wonder if there was a, a a cut scene, like, like a move, a scene cut from the movie that might have set that up a little bit better. Or I'm also thinking, you know, maybe a place that they could have worked it in was after Meg didn't get the river guardian. Yeah. See, but that's, that's still about halfway through because that's when he talks about the selling your soul to me. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause it does feel like that's our first hint that Meg is like working for him under duress. Cause he's like, I'll add two years to your contract instead of subtracting two. But it, Again, it just feels like I would like him to have made more deals with more people just to kind of understand that that's a big part of his personality. Also, it felt like the deals are quite binding. Uh, And I think Hercules' whole deal at the end of the movie was like, if I rescue Meg, I'll stay here. Like, I want to rescue her, but, you know, in return, you'll just get me. And Hades is like, 
cool, sounds good. And then when Hercules does rescue her, he Hercules is like, no, just kidding, I'm leaving. And it's like, I don't know, it feels like they're they're magically binding contracts because like Hades didn't restore Hercules' strength when Meg was hurt. It just happened automatically. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, that was just like a, I wish they would have got him into a deal that he thought worked in his favor but didn't. That would have been an interesting way. Like kind of like the, like Jafar in Aladdin where it's like you, Mm -hmm. you get him to make his own deal on his own terms, not realizing that it's a bad move. Fair. I I totally agree. And I don't think that Hercules being a God would preclude him from having to fulfill his deal with Hades because Persephone, uh, who does not appear in the movie at all, of course, um, but who, uh, canonically (laughs) mythologically is the wife of Hades. She is a Greek goddess and she still is locked into a contract that requires her to spend a big chunk of her time Mm -hmm. in, in Hades with Hades in the underworld. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I, there's a lot of that in this movie where it feels like there are elements from like a couple different versions of the script that, you could tell we're probably at one point more fleshed out, but didn't get there. The The big point of the movie that sticks out to me as an example of that is there's all of this stuff with Hercules becoming this big celebrity, this big, like, pe- he's got action figures, he's got his own drink, he's being painted on everything, he's incredibly wealthy, and it feels like they're setting that up to be something, but it never really comes back in the end. Like, you know, it, there's never anything at the end that's like, you know, actually I didn't, you know, th- this is all bad or like I, it has, it's to my detriment that all this and it doesn't really matter. The only thing that happens really is that he just gets, Hercules himself just kind of gets upset because he just wants to be a god and that's it. Um, but it just, I don't know, it feels like it's kind of half, half there. Like there's an idea that's like close to saying something but it's not quite there, in my opinion. Yeah, because he he gives up his godhood to be with Meg because a life without her would be incomplete. But also, he's going back to a life where, a life where he's basically a god on Earth. Yeah, yeah. He, he will so continue to... So how much is he to, really giving up? He will continue to be incredibly wealthy and popular and famous, and that's never seen as a bad thing, um, and which is fine. It just feels like... It just feels like they're they're trying to say something. I just don't know what it is. I mean, that being a true hero, a, a hero isn't measured by the size of his strength, but the strength of his heart. Yeah, I mean, that's what they're trying to say. I think there's like a lot of different messages in the movie for sure. Um, that's that's a big one. It, it is interesting though that when he does start becoming popular and rich and famous, that all of a sudden Hercules starts turning into this almost like, almost like entitled, like, yeah, I get to be a God now, right? I get to be God now. This is Mm -hmm. the deal that I made. But even that's kind of undercut by the line in zero to hero, where they say that he was the nicest guy and not conceited or anything. So it's not even like he's losing his personality to this rich and this, this wealth and this fame. So it's like, I don't know. I feel like, They could have chosen one route or the other, and it just feels like it's kind of muddied for me. You know, they probably could have had a a good moment of him giving things up or or talking about giving things up with Meg Mm -hmm. because that's like... He just had the conversation with Zeus where he realizes he's not enough. Phil is going down his schedule. Hercules throws his temper tantrum and is like, what's the point? Right, yeah. And, And so, like, there could have been a moment of vulnerability where he's like, maybe this isn't all worth it or something, but instead they wanted to focus on the love story aspect, which is fine. Yeah, which is but fine. I think him opening up and showing some vulnerability to Meg could have been an interesting move. Yeah, I think, and I want to be clear as I'm just like bringing up a whole lot of like nitpicks in here. I still, lo- I still like this movie a whole lot. Let's go back to that at the beginning of this episode where I said, yeah, everyone should watch it. It's great. Ignore- oh, we haven't even gotten to the music yet. I, be- I, I feel like we're both waiting on it because we know once we start talking about the music, we will not stop talking about the music. We're going to do it. Might as well just rip that bandaid off. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's talk about the music. It's oh. amazing. So um, I suggested that we cover Hercules uh, when Tyler and Ethan asked us to, to do a, a guest host because I remember the uh, Muses Medley music video that came out that that was um, 
done by the the group of, of five black men. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe the person who put that together is uh, Michael K. Something. Um, we'll be sure to give proper credits in the description. Uh, and I sent that to you, Scott, and you responded back that you viewed it as a personal success uh, or a, like a testament to, of success to how many people had sent you that video to watch. <laughs> It's a good and, time. And that just like that struck a nerve with me because it's like, yes, multiple people are like, yes, you like Hercules, you like music, you will like this. Go watch it. Yes. And I think it's great. Uh yeah, I think it's it's fantastic. I I think the the overall use of gospel music in a story about gods is is very inspired. Uh genuinely, I think it's such a smart uh, such a smart move and a, such a smart direction to go in. Absolutely yeah. agreed. It. And I think that the the women who they had singing the parts of the muses were just so bonkers talented. Absolutely. Um, just, uh, I could listen to them sing anything all day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A hundred percent. I mean, this, this movie has such iconic songs as uh, uh, Go the Distance, classic one, don't can't say I'm in love or won't say I'm in love, whatever that one. Yeah. Iconic. Even though I don't know the name. Um, what a zero to hero, zero to hero, the arguably the, the best bop on the whole thing. Uh, I even break out into Phil's song. The, so you want to be a hero kid. Like I'm when I'm on car rides and it gets boring and people aren't talking. My instinct is to just go, so you want to be a hero kid. <laughs> like it's just, it, the songs are so good. Incredible. Yeah. I, this, I truly think that Hercules is some of Alan Menken's best work. Yes. And, and like he, he composed so much during the Renaissance and just it, because the music, he's found a way for the music to accent and accentuate the singers while not overpowering them. Yeah. And I just, mm, it's so good. It's, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. And, and it mixes this really interesting, like again, again, it's like this gospel music, but it's also mixed in with these very triumphant horns that sound like they're big and bold and like bigger than life. God themes. Um, they sound triumphant and mm-hmm. inspiring and like fanfare, but it's all mixed together and interwoven very well. I think. Oh Yes. Oh yes, and and all all of the reprises of gospel truth yes. are, are like they're they're story driving, and I think this is something that like some musicals tend to struggle with is that it'll be like and oh we're gonna do a musical number over here uh, that like explains parts of the plot but doesn't uh, doesn't move the scene on really like it yeah. holds you in the scene for too long exactly and and I think that the way that they integrated the music helps push the story forward rather than hold us in this moment for a little longer. There, Yeah, there were at least two, maybe three montage songs where but by the start of the song, there's one thing. Uh, I mean, yeah, you could look at Go the Distance starts with him questioning everything and ends with him now on this quest to find Phil. So like that drove the plot forward there. Mm -hmm. Uh, You've got one last hope for sure. One last hope is the whole training montage. Zero to hero is like this. Here's the first time he battled. Here's his standing in society now. Um, And of course, yeah, yeah. Everything, the whole start where they're reprising. um, What was that first song called? Gospel truth. Gospel truth. Everything about gospel truth. Um, coming back and, and uh, stirring the plot forward. I, sp- I especially love when they get to the gospel truth about Hades and the underworld. It's like slow. It's mm-hmm. like a little melancholy. It's really interesting. Uh, and it like feels heavy. It feels like, oh, I don't want to mess with Hades. Yeah. yeah. I um I don't think I noticed the art so much of the underworld as a kid that I did now. Like I was always enraptured by the very skull looking centerpiece that I never noticed that there's like a whole underworld city yeah. in that art piece. And I'm just <sighs> like, I suddenly have so many questions. It's so good. Yeah. There's, I mean, I, I was talking about this with, with when I was watching it with Emily last night, like 
still talking about all of his previous heroes that he worked with and, and that he helped train. It just sets up this big world and we're just seeing a slice of it. And oh, that, yeah. that kind of that goes with your with exactly what you're talking about with Hades, where like we get to see these bits and pieces of the underworld, but there's clearly some much bigger stuff going on. And like, yeah, you, he's talking about uh, Phil's talking about uh, Achilles. He's talking about uh, all these other people. And you're just like, man, I kind of want to know those stories like i kind of want it made me want a i know there was like a hercules tv show the animated series and that focused on like hercules in high school or whatever but i would have preferred a like phil prequel spinoff where it's him every season is him training a different hero and it like every season is that hero's downfall. Like that would have been really oh fun to gosh. watch. And so it's just Ooh. like every season's a totally different story. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Who do it. you think taught Jason how to sail? Cleopatra? <laughs> That's right. Oh, yeah. And, and something uh, fun about Hercules is it, it absolutely throws any sort of mythological or historical accuracy out the window except mm -hmm. in like little moments. So like when Hercules fights the Cyclops, he blinds the Cyclops with, mm -hmm. with fire and then ties something around his feet, which is like something yeah. that happens in Greek mythology. It's just not Hercules or more accurately Heracles doing right. it. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that's the biggest sort of like wrong thing about this movie is that Hercules is not, a, a Greek figure uh, like all of the other gods are. Mm -hmm. be, I, I will say that I think the biggest deviation from Greek mythology is actually Zeus being a caring and involved parent. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the biggest one. They're just like, uh, yeah, like, like when Hercules is like, why did you get rid of me? Didn't you, didn't you love me? And he's like, of course we loved you. And it's like, man, Zeus, you got so much other stuff going on. Like you don't even, you don't care about anyone but yourself. Get yeah. out of here. Oh, Ugh. I love it though. And in the original mythology, Hades also wanted the underworld. It wasn't a negative thing, but again, like you need a story, you need a bad guy and mm -hmm. just so well done. That was an interesting line that I picked up this watch through was when Hades says to Zeus, like, yeah, oh, I have a full time job managing the underworld, which is, you know, something that you appointed to me very graciously. Thank Th you. That you so charitably bestowed on me, yeah. Zeus. So mm -hmm. can't. Love to, but can't. Yeah, exactly. And so it's just like th that almost feels like it could tell some sort of message about um because there almost is this sense of the gods are these like a, a higher a larger than life beings who just are so naturally blessed with gifts and can do whatever they want and like here's hades who's just kind of like stuck working and just trying to like kind of shove it to them and it could be like an al if they wanted it to they could get us with like a couple different tweaks they could absolutely get us on the side of hades where it's just like yeah, honestly, these gods are doing nothing and they're running the place and you're doing so much and you're not getting any recognition for it. Yeah, dude, I'm on your side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, something with the art that I think really stood out too is that all of the gods, of course, had this like aura around them and behind them. And yes. also when you listened to them speak, when the gods spoke, it had a little bit of reverb in it. Yes, every single okay. god, every single time, mm -hmm. including Hercules for the brief little bit that he was a god, he had that reverb. But yeah. Hades never did. Mm. And so it was just a really interesting little thing that like not only in in the art design, which was done by hand, and I have to remind myself every single time yeah. that like that, the light and shading that they did on that was done fully by hand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think Hera probably was the most impressive one because she, it looked like she was sparkling and reflective. Yeah. And modern technology would make that really easy, but they hand drew all of that. That's and I'm so just, crazy. What? Yeah. Absolutely <laughs> wild. I, yes. And I think you're right. I mean, just like the... Hades had at least a little that his hair is a very fun thing. But yeah, he didn't glow. He didn't have any sort of reverb. It really like puts him on a different tier compared to the rest of the gods, um, which is interesting. And I'm wondering if I'm wondering how much of that was because like intentional, like this helps t kind of separate Hades from the other Olympians versus, well, Hades is a main character and we can't do that through the whole movie because uh, that would be a lot of work. So uh, we'll just not. And it could just be a combination of both. 
I don't know. Um, one of the things that uh, knowing behind the scenes, apparently James Woods sort of helped shape the character of Hades. Like previously, they sort of expected that he'd be more classic Disney villain. You yeah. know, have have the deep booming voice and things like that. And yeah. when James Woods came in and auditioned and basically made him a fast talking car salesman, I think yeah. was what he said. Yeah. Um. It was just. It was so different in style from how all of the other gods were it, I, except Hermes. I would say that Hermes probably was the closest to uh, James Woods right, as far yeah. as tempo and style and that sort of thing, but just so distant from Zeus and all of the other gods who really talked at all that I, I feel like Hades character just shifted yeah. when they cast him. Absolutely. And I, I think for the better too, because like, I think it's, it seems like it would be the easiest and most straightforward thing to make Hades this big, strong, you know, menacing looking, physically intimidating character. Uh, to, if, if you want to show them rivaling Zeus, for example. But it just feels like the shift to make him uh, very far away from that and make him more... Uh, I don't even know what the word would be. I, I, the word that comes to mind is just long. Everything about him is long. He's got long fingers that are very creepy. He's got a long face that that is much is very narrow. Um, everything about him is just like it's creepy, but it's not like intimidating in, in like a physical sense. So I feel like it making him that shifting him away from that was a very smart choice. Mm hmm. Um, I have just decided how to fix your Hades doesn't make deals in the movie like he should. Oh, please. James Woods as Hades should have had a song. Yeah. About making deals. Should have had a song. About he making needed deals. a villain song. Yeah, I agree. They haven't because, done. Yeah. Like, like, what was the what was the villain song in this movie? Was it uh, through Hades horrid plant? No, nope, yeah, that was I, that was still positive. Like it's well, so that, that's about as that's as, yeah, that's about as much as we got was was the kind of reprises of gospel truth just talking about who Hades is. But yeah, he didn't get like a song that's like, hey, guess what? I like making deals with people. And then because I even thought a thing about Hades making deals is that he's very underhanded and he'll grant you what you want, but something bad always comes with it. So it could be someone being like, oh, I want my sick grandma to to have her youth back. And it's like, oh, absolutely, I'll grant you that. She'll take your youth. You're old now. She's young. Whoops. Or like someone's like, I just want to be fabulously wealthy. And it's like, congratulations, you got it. You've just robbed a bank. You're on the run now. Good luck. Like it, it'll just be like <laughs> stuff where... You get what you want, but there's always a downside, like a monkey's paw monkey's sort paw, of thing. Monkey's paw, yeah. Exactly. And so, and that even made me think that could have been what happened with Meg, where Meg asks for her boyfriend's life back and he gets his life, but is no longer interested in Meg. And it's just like, ooh, new person. I'm going to go check them out. So it's again, this kind of like underhanded, like you'll get what you want, but it's not going to work out the way you think. Um, and like, that would have been an interesting perspective and an interesting way to make that that whole deal making stuff work throughout the story yes so literally it could have been instead of him saying you sold your soul to me to save your boyfriend's life and how does he repay you like instead of having that be words yeah he could have been you know something about making our deal you could even have called the song uh you know shake the monkey's paw or something like that. Like there's, there's yeah. so many ways that they could have done it in that little moment there where you could see him making those bad deals that you were talking about. Yeah. And then ending with Meg's. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Which would set up him making deals better. It would set up the story behind how Meg is working for him a little bit better too. Um, which even that doesn't make too much sense. Cause like, why is she indebted to him? Was that part of the deal then, I suppose? That, like, I'll be insert indebted to you if you give my boyfriend's life back. Um, so, like, yeah, even that could be... Like, why doesn't he have more servants if he's making these deals all over the place? I don't know. So, um, so I am looking up uh, the musical version of Hercules, and apparently... The, the musical Broadway version uh, has a song called A Cool Day in Hell. So I might look that up. That sounds like it would be 
a villain song. The villain song. Yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe that's what this was missing. Maybe. Yeah. The top search result says Disney's Hercules musical is better than Frozen and Aladdin. Oh. Um, so this person thinks very highly of it. So I might just have to look up the musical and see see if I can find that could be fun. Yeah, musicals should be available on online, not just on stage. I agree. Send tweet. I <laughs> controversial agree. tweet. A controversial tweet. Put that in there. <laughs> uh no, yes, I think I, I agree with that. Uh but yeah, I think I think a little bit more background on Hades and the underworld would have been nice especially because and again i'm just reiterating but especially because these big two two deals happen at the end of the film that are so crucial to the plot i feel like the whole deal making should have been set up a little bit better yep that's all i'm saying huh. anything else you want to talk about with this film maroonie um gosh i just i just really love this movie i I would say that from the time I knew what having a favorite movie went, mm-hmm. or, like like what that meant, probably all the way up through late college, I would have called Hercules my favorite movie. I don't know if I have a favorite movie now. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. Um. So so like it, it didn't necessarily get replaced with anything so much as my uh my listing got more nuanced. That makes sense. Um. But yeah, gosh, I just I just love this movie. I think it's fantastic. If they do a live action remake, who are you casting? Oh boy. Um, Oh, that's a rough one. That's a tough one. I mean, I feel like first and foremost, Danny DeVito could still play Phil. Absolutely. Perfect. Don't even change it. Don't even change it. Um, I don't really know who I would cast for anyone else. I've not thought about this. Have you thought about this? Um, I've thought more about the muses than anything else. Okay, lay it on me. Um, I feel like Jennifer Hudson definitely needs to be one of them. 100%. Um, I would love Lizzo there. I think she's got a great voice. Ooh, I yes. I buck the the trend. A lot of people say Beyoncé and I love Beyoncé, but I don't think she should be a muse because Beyoncé has and always has had a a soloist voice. Yes. Yeah. And and even when she did like Destiny's Child and everything, like you could always pick out Beyonce's voice because she just like it's it's a type of power that makes her stand out of a crowd rather than blend into it. And I think something that the muses have that really benefits them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that's um, good. I am just blanking on on the whole whole rest of this list. Uh, I would love to see Idris Elba as Zeus. Yes. He, oh, I love it. I just I feel like he has that that powerful presence that would be needed for that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but also the jovial, spirited. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I haven't thought about this as much as I mean. Who do you cast for Hercules? Who do you cast goes, for Hercules? I mean, he goes from a zero to a hero, and that's, I'll that's tell a, you who you cast as Hercules. You cast uh uh. A Liam Hemsworth, maybe. I don't know. Or a Chris Hemsworth. I, Chris Hemsworth could definitely could definitely do buff buff Hercules. Can't, and I suppose they could, one they of the could Hemsworths. debuff him. Yeah. They could debuff him the same way that they did for Chris Evans. For... Exactly. Just cast one of the Hemsworths. They're doing mm-hmm. stuff. Um they I, I did see I've seen some fan casting around this, casting like Chris Pratt as Hercules. Don't want that. No. Not no. for me. Uh uh uh. Chris Pratt has had enough. He can take a break. We're done with <laughs> the world has evolved past the need for Chris Pratt. We're done. Yeah, we we don't need the fourth like like we don't need the worst Chris. We don't. You're exactly right. Um mm-hmm. I I'm trying to think of who would make a really good, smooth talking Hades Ooh. who just Villain castings are always the most fun. Who I mean, my you... my knee jerk reaction is Adam Driver because I just feel like he can play that. He's got some range on him. Dark and slimy. Yeah, but but also polishes up nice. Well, yeah, I like that. I also think um, th- I always cast this actor as a villain just because I think he would be a good villain. And I think he's been only played a villain once, but I think a Paul Bettany is a very good. Uh, actor who can play comedic but also sinister very ham it up i think that's good um oh yeah I, I was uncertain who this person was until i looked at a picture i think he's 
great. He played a villain once in in Solo, the Star Wars movie, and I mm-hmm. think he was one of the most enjoyable parts of that movie for me, just because he really hams it up as a villain, and I appreciate that. Yes. Um. Oh. Yeah. I do you have a favorite song? A favorite song. My my instinct is to say Go the Distance just cuz I think the melody is so catchy. My only issue with Go the Distance is that it is in like three parts with lots of long pauses between the parts. Um and that's my only issue with it. Otherwise, I think it's a great song. If I had to pick one that I could just listen to probably on repeat, uh it would be it would be Zero to Hero with um, like won't say I'm in love being like right there, right behind it. You know, I, I tend to agree with that. I also would say that a star is born is pretty high up for me. Oh, that's good. Um, it just, it's so celebratory and really fun. Uh, when I, uh, drove my car down from Illinois to Miami, um, <laughs> detouring into Pennsylvania for reasons unimportant. So it was, it was a, a multi, multi, multi day drive when, we were driving into Florida. We had been listening to Disney music and go the distance played as we drove across the bridge into Florida. So that song will just always feel really victorious for me because it was like, all right, we've drive, we've been driving for 17 hours and Mm -hmm. (sighs) we're finally Mm -hmm. here. We're here. Yeah. Even though literally entering into Florida getting to Miami, you still have like seven more hours to drive minimum. Doesn't matter. Small victories along the way. <laughs> yes. Oh, no, I think that's great. I think, have they, has, has Disney confirmed that they're going to do a live action Hercules? I've been seeing like back and forth on that one. I don't think that they have, but you know, I, I haven't played, I, I, I haven't paid as much attention to things like this. I, I see lots of like casting requests but I, it, it says Disney's Hercules remake is already being fan cast. So it seems that it is intended. Okay. Yes. The, the only mandatory casting, in my opinion, is that Danny DeVito has to play Phil. There I, is no one else in the world who can play Phil. There's no one. And I think if I can throw out a, like a curveball choice with my Hercules casting, it's not even that much of a curveball because it's, it's still, it's still like a, 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 a white guy. But uh, it, I would say unlikely choice. Give me some Zac Efron. Give me a buff Zac Efron. I would also be into that and definitely was something that occurred to me. Because it's got to be a musical, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be. They didn't make Mulan a musical. But if it is a musical, he's got a good old voice. I would also love to see and hear songs from Zeus and we could throw Dwayne Johnson in there. That would be good. Like, he, he sang for Moana. It wasn't great, but it was singing. It works. People like that song. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. I think there's a lot of options. And if it's not Zac Efron, I'm going to cry and scream. So... <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, before we wrap up, Scott, what score out of 100 would you give Hercules? I give Hercules a solid 80. Awesome. I give Hercules a 93. I, In some ways, it was better than I remember as a kid, and in other ways, it didn't live up to my memory, but that's okay. That's still a solid B plus on whatever scale I had. Yeah. Um, And so with the audience score that, again, was 85.5, that places Disney's Hercules as having a... Uh, an 84.975, so it, we're going to call it an 85 solidly. Woo. And that would place it on the list currently at number five, just below Fellowship of the Ring and just above Ratatouille. Um, mm. so what do you think, Scott? Is Hercules better than Ratatouille? No, <laughs> it's not. I disagree. Uh, no, I think uh, I only watched Ratatouille for the first time last year and I love it a lot. It's really good. And Hercules is solid. It's not better than Ratatouille. <laughs> um, you know, I feel like I've grown to love Ratatouille more in the last year because of the TikTok musical for it. Mm-hmm. I, in a weird way, it has expanded on the original story for me. So I, I also am hard pressed to put it fully above uh, Ratatouille, um, but 
according to our scores, it does in fact land fifth on the list. So you've got It's a Wonderful Life in first, uh, and then the three Lord of the Rings in reverse order in two, three, and four, <laughs> and then and then Hercules. I what if hear me out. What if the whole time Hercules wears that headband? What if under that headband is a tiny little rat that's controlling Hercules, <laughs> doing all the punching and things? And it's, it's all the punching. And yeah, it's Rata Hercules. I love it. R- Rata Rata Hercules. That's exact. Mm, you know, we should have considered that Hercules was just a puppet. Every look, all of everyone who wears a hat or a head accessory probably has a little rat under there controlling them. You can't trust Jordan. and I are both wearing headphones right now. What's under the headphones. We'll never, I, know. I mean, mine is a mouse, not a rat. That's fair. I don't have hair. So I think that's how, you know, you can trust me. How can, a, <laughs> how can an animal control me if I have no hair? That's the, big I question. mean, Hades didn't have any hair either. And I don't think we should have trusted him. Ah, that's fair. Um, shoot. I never pay attention to th- how episodes of any of, my podcasts end. Should so, we talk um, about us and why we're here and the other show that we do? Yeah, you know, we probably should have talked about that th- at the top, but I've, it's fine. I was thinking about that. Hey, if you made it all the way through and you're like, who are these two goobers? Uh, we're people who do voice stuff on other uh, WB&E projects, specifically the one called Late to the Party. Jordan, you can describe Late to the Party better than I can. Yeah, uh, so Late to the Party is an actual play Dungeons & Dragons podcast on which I am the Dungeon Master. Uh, Scott plays the uh, fabulous and wonderful Coach Tucker, and I I think I know when this episode is coming out. Uh, will be the Thursday following uh, the newest episode of Late to the Party going up on January 18th, and uh, you should absolutely go check that out, or you can check out Scott's incredible DMing podcast uh, in our Christmas campaign that we did called A Christmas Peril. Um, yeah. Which was basically if uh, Ebenezer Scrooge from A Christmas Carol decided that he didn't want to learn his lessons and hired ghost hunters to yeah. go out and fight his ghosts. So if you're looking for a little nugget, check that out. And if you're looking for a big story, check out yeah. all of Late to the Party we and got, all of our side quests. What do we got? Close to 30 episodes of the main story right now? Yeah. So uh, I think we've got 20, 25 that are up. Yeah. So uh, as of published date plenty of the back catalog to go through you can yeah we've had multiple little side quests that are shorter adventures and if those pique your interest or you just want to dive right on into the main story lots to catch up on very fun all the way through jordan does a fantastic job telling this story and having fun moments for all of our characters fun combat hilarious jokes it's a good time yep uh, if you want to check out Late to the Party on social media, it is at L-T-T-P-D-N-D. That is all letters. Yep. Uh, if you want to find me, I am at Super Awesome Jeb, J-E-B, on Twitter. Uh, Scott, how can folks find you? Yeah, you can find me on most social media places, just at Scott Nicewander, which is my name, and it's really long. Uh, so here's me spelling it really quickly. S-C-O-T-T-N-I-S-W-A-N-D-E-R. Uh, but also, I have a YouTube channel called NerdSync, uh, N-E-R-D-S-Y-N-C. Didn't think you'd get a spelling lesson at the end of this episode, did you? Uh, uh, if, yeah. if you want to follow Bacon and Eggs, you can follow them at Bacon and Eggs Pod, and you can check out Bacon and Eggs Late to the Party, and all of the other WBNE shows at WBNE.org. Fantastic. What do we do now? How do we end this? Uh, How do we say goodbye? I genuinely don't know. So um, you want to be a hero, kid? Well, whoop de doo <laughs> I've been Jordan. He's been Scott. Thanks so much for joining us. And Tyler and Ethan, I believe we'll be back next week, if not the week after. Thanks for having us. Bye, everyone.